Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Carl Hart. It was recorded in March 2015 at Littlefield in Brooklyn as part of Brain Awareness Week. You know, when they, they told me this was in Brooklyn, I, I kind of expected a different cr- crowd. You know, I, uh, I grew up with 1990s hip hop, and when people said Brooklyn's in the house, I thought of another sort of racial composition. But uh, so my story was geared towards that crowd. <laughs> but just to let you all know, you all should know some things about me. See, I grew up in the hood, and so when I think about the hood, I was thinking about Brooklyn's in the house. Um, I grew up in the hood, wrong side of the tracks, wrong side of the poverty line, sometimes wrong side of crime as well. You know, I engaged in petty crimes, I used and sold drugs, I carried a gun. The fact is, by the time I was 17, I probably should have been dead or in jail. But eventually, I kind of took formal education seriously, and I earned a PhD in neuroscience. And earning that PhD in neuroscience changed my trajectory and maybe even saved my life. You see, I studied neuroscience specifically because I wanted to solve the drug addiction problem. I believed, I fully believed, that drugs was the cause of poverty and crime in my neighborhood. So I reasoned that if I could solve or cure a drug addiction, I could fix the poverty and crime in my neighborhood. But I stand before you here tonight saying that I now realize that neuroscience alone is is insufficient to address these issues. I came to this conclusion while writing my recent book, High Price. For the book, I interviewed old friends from the neighborhood and relatives. One of those interviews was particularly poignant. It was with my cousin, Louis. Uh, He and I, we shared a bed growing up in my grandmother's house when when we were kids. Louis was a math whiz, you see, and he helped sharpen my math skills and intensify my desire to do well in math. But now, Louis lives in a halfway house in Fort Lauderdale. And when I had saw him last, I hadn't seen him in 30 years uh, prior to that. I was shocked by his appearance. He stood about six feet tall, but weighed at most 110 pounds. His face, it was drawn emaciated, and the few remaining teeth that he had were on their way out. My shock turned to profound sadness, but I only showed that I was happy to see him because, you see, I didn't want to make him feel bad. I didn't want to make him feel bad. A benefit and a drawback of my decades in science is that I have now become a master at hiding my emotion. 
And this skill was seriously being tested as Louis stood before me. We slapped hands, embraced, and without interruption, Louis talked for the next hour. He talked about the various crimes that he had committed over the years and the amount of money he had stolen and stashed. I learned that the police had beaten him up on many occasions. He contemplated whether he should have become an informant. He wondered whether or not he, had, he should have just said, drop dime, as he said, or turned state on them. But at the same time, he was really proud, extremely proud, of not being a snitch-ass bitch. <laughs> Louis' thoughts were disjointed and difficult to follow. He jumped from one subject to another without break or transition. He paced around the yard the entire time I was there. His, in, his involuntary, repetitive movements were a textbook case of tardive dyskinesia brought on by taking antipsychotic medication for more than two decades. All the detail, although the details are not clear, family lore has it that he was initially put on these meds in the ER after having a bad reaction to some, un, to, to some unknown street drug. And when he was sent to prison, they kept him on these, on, on these medications in order to make sure he was obedient and calm. You know, a chemical straitjacking. In graduate school, I learned quite a bit about antipsychotic medications and what they were used for. See, these were the medications that were used to treat schizophrenia and related disorders. The simplistic idea is that psychotic behaviors such as those seen in schizophrenia are caused by overactivation of dopamine cells in the midbrain. You all all know about dopamine. It's in the National Enquirer by now, so you all know about it. <laughs> Antipsychotic medications block dopamine uh, receptors and thereby prevent the, over, the overactivation of these dopamine neurons. Behaviorally, these drugs quiet the voices in the heads of schizophrenics and reduce their paranoia and agitation. The problem is this. Some of these medications, the type that my cousin Louis was on, block dopamine receptors so extensively that the brain compensates by increasing the density of dopamine receptors. The brain is now hypersensitive to dopamine, and after years of treatment, the person develops tardive dyskinesia and becomes even more susceptible to psychotic symptoms. In other words, the treatment for psychotic symptoms can actually cause psychosis. It's a trap. With each passing moment, Louis' voice became background noise, and I felt more and more grief and despair. I wondered how this has happened, but I already knew, because his story wasn't unique. I had seen similar scenarios with other males' loved ones. Virtually all of them had been initially caught up in the system via drug charge while in their teens or early 20s, and that began a vicious cycle from which they couldn't escape. The skills that sustains people throughout life are usually obtained during young adulthood. This is a critical period. I, for example, spent most of my young adult years in classrooms, in laboratories, learning how to think and how to write how to be non-threatening, and how to be white. These skills have allowed me to support my family financially. As a result, I have a stake in this sick society. Society and I both benefit. In contrast, so many of the black boys with whom I grew up didn't have a chance to claim their stake in this society. They didn't acquire the necessary skills and didn't get the needed support during the critical period. Instead, they were under the supervision of a system that doesn't seem to understand or care about the importance of black males being invested in this society. Supporters of this system have an irrational focus on eliminating certain drugs and are preoccupied with those who violate those drug laws, especially if they're black. Selective enforcement of drug laws, in effect, serves as a tool to marginalize black males and keep them in this vicious cycle of incarceration and isolation from mainstream society. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting 
that people shouldn't be sanctioned for legal infractions because there are times when sanctions are quite appropriate. However, the penalty should not be so severe that the penalized young person is unable to recover and stake a claim in society. In such cases, we all lose. And with no real stake in society, many of my friends and relatives feel that they have nothing more to lose. And as James Baldwin so eloquently put it, quote, the most dangerous creation of any society is a man who has nothing to lose, end quote. As my time with Louis was drawing to an end, I was reminded of the days when we were kids climbing the huge tree in my grandmother's yard. Don't go too high, he would say. You see, he was older than I was, and he felt compelled to look after me to make sure that I didn't step on a weak branch and fall. After saying goodbye to Louis, I sat in the car and I cried because I felt as though I had failed to look after him as he had done for me when we were kids. Prior to writing my book, I hadn't cried since I was a child. Now, in the car, a flood of tears poured from my eyes. I thought about all the other Louis we had failed to look after. I thought about all the years I had spent away from my Florida family in pursuit of an education to obtain a PhD in neuroscience that is clearly inadequate to, inadequate to solve the problems that they face. The tears continued streaming down as I thought about the tremendous promise that Louis once showed. He certainly showed more potential than I had as children. After several minutes, I gathered myself, started the car, Johnny Cash was on the radio singing, there'll be peace in the valley for me, dear Lord, I pray. And I slowly drove away. As I think about Louis' story, it makes me feel somewhat like a failure. But I wrote this story about two and a half, three years ago. And now as I step back and take a broader perspective, I can't help but be encouraged. I'm optimistic that my work, my research, as well as others, is destroying the myths about drugs and exposing the racist foundation on which many of our policies are built. My work, as well as other work, people's work, is also helping to keep people safe and out of jail here and abroad. Case in point, we have finally had an attorney general who has come out of the closet publicly and said that our drug laws have had racially discriminatory effects and has, in effect, decimated certain black communities. Hopefully, appropriate policies will follow. And abroad in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the mayor has implemented a program based on the work of mines and other people, has implemented a program in which crack users are given a job, three hots and a cot. And for you all who don't know what three hots and a cot means, <laughs> it's a bed and three meals a day. There are, and this program has been extremely successful. They have dramatically decreased the number of drug users, and so-called drug problems. So yes, I am optimistic. I can't help but be optimistic. I'm optimistic because the world, the world is no longer flat when we talk about drugs. We are now dealing with evidence, at least when we talk about drugs. And with that, thank you all for listening. That was Carl Hart. Carl is a member of the faculty at Columbia University, jointly appointed in the departments of psychology and psychiatry. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in neuroscience, psychology, and pharmacology, and has been recognized for excellence in teaching with the university's highest teaching award. He's also a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute in the Division of Substance Abuse. 
For high price, his first trade book, he received the 2014 Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. This event was produced with B. Brainy NYC as part of Brain Awareness Week 2015. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, and Skylar Bear. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio, and the theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show, to Heather McKellar and Heather Bowling from B. Brainy NYC for being amazing partners. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.